So our final scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 25 through 33. Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon, in all his glory, was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things. And indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we can say, thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? So God, we pray for a world full of worry, for a world full of the desire to continue to acquire, to possess, that you would stay that in us, that you would open our hearts to the goodness you've already given us. God, that you would open our hearts to see where you are present. And God, just as you are present in each and every day, you are present in this moment. So come, Holy Spirit, guide us, that as we read this word, you would point us to the word made flesh, who is Jesus, that we could follow after him and grow more like that word in the world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So a little sermon announcement is uh, this was supposed to be our last week of kind of a stewardship, money, finance uh, uh, discussion, but I'm going to add one more because I I missed a really important discussion for us, which is next week we're going to talk about Sabbath which is not something we always do very well. So next week, we're going we're gonna to do our, is actually our last week of this series, and we're going to talk about Sabbath. So if you've ever wondered, feel free to be here next week. And this week is our final one. We're talking about thankfulness a few weeks before Thanksgiving. Now, the trend has begun to die down, but if you spent any number of minutes on social media, maybe on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, within the past few years, you may have seen the hashtag blessed. Uh, My wife was a youth pastor, so all the kids would do hashtag blessed. The phrase and reference was so popular that it was used in a Bruno Mars song. Um, There were mega church sermons about it in commercials. In many places, you could see hashtag blessed. And not too long ago when I was on a college campus, it wasn't uncommon to hear some of my students at FSU Wesley say the phrase hashtag blessed while referring to any number of situations. So this week I took a stroll through Instagram, and and, in Instagram you can look at hashtags specifically, and looked at all the blessed posts that I could find. And here's what I saw. An attractive, young, well-to-do person, well-dressed, sitting in one of the most beautiful places in the world. Someone was in Santorini in Greece, someone was in the Rocky Mountains, someone was in Venice, Italy, someone was overlooking the Mediterranean. They were hashtag blessed. Any number of pictures of food or fancy drinks, $7 lattes, the perfect smoothie, a cocktail with the city skyline in the background, a decadent steak with mashed potatoes and green beans, and they were hashtag blessed. New shoes that probably cost a good amount of money were hashtag blessed. Fancy cars in mint condition were hashtag blessed. Some of the posts weren't materialistic, though. Some of the things were legitimately great things to be thankful for. Someone reaching a new personal record at the gym this week being hashtag blessed. Someone getting engaged to someone they love deeply, hashtag blessed. Someone announcing a pregnancy, hashtag blessed. Someone buying a new home, even in the midst of the pandemic, saying they are hashtag blessed. 
This hashtag and response is often a moment of thankfulness for life's little pleasures and even for some of the more momentous occasions. You can hear someone say it now, oh, I'm blessed. And while all of these things are great, I, don't, I think they're all wonderful, I wonder if we get a misunderstanding of what being blessed is by revolving around this hashtag. And as a result, we get a misunderstanding of what it means to be thankful. So often our understanding of being thankful is about, or being blessed, is centered on what we can count, on what we can look around and say, well, I have this, and this is going well for me. And again, there's nothing wrong with this. This is a good thing for us to take stock of what is good in our lives and enjoy it and celebrate it. But it leads us to a troublesome place if that's the only understanding we have of being thankful. If being blessed is about what's going well and what's going right, then people in difficult situations are not blessed. I don't agree with that, but that's what that logic can lead to. If being thankful is about taking stock of the good in our lives, then people who are struggling aren't allowed to be thankful, and I can tell you that that has not been my experience. This is a slippery slope, I think, if we don't uh, uh, identify it to the prosperity gospel, which is the idea that good and blessed Christians prosper materially. This tells many people that God is not with them, that God does not care about them. If I'm blessed because of my car, then the person who takes the bus to work is cursed, in a way. If I'm blessed because of my healthy family, then the family struggling with some disease is cursed, and it is my firm belief that God does not look down on or curse us with struggling. In fact, in the same sermon we read today from Jesus, Jesus flips our understanding of blessedness with the Beatitudes. He says, blessed are the poor, blessed are those who mourn. Blessing exists outside of what we can applaud in our lives. And therefore, thanksgiving can exist outside and apart from our possessions. When we make thankfulness about what we have, what is going well, we reject a vision for Christian faithfulness that I learned through a good friend named Terry. Terry and I worked in Jacksonville, well, close to Jacksonville, one summer fixing homes and building a playground at a small church in Palatka, Florida. Now, Palatka is nowhere. I, I don't imagine people in, uh, in, in, in Maryland to know where it is, but people in Florida kind of know where it is. Uh, it's a tiny town on the southern edge of the St. John's River, right where the river springs up, and it boasts the first drive-in diner in Florida, the oldest one in Florida. It's a gaudy chrome structure on US 17. You could pass right by it if you weren't looking, but it kind of blinds you when the sun hits it just right. Terry was an older gentleman. He was about 50. He had worked in construction most of his life. His hands were callous from working with concrete. He lived in a small one-bedroom apartment, and when I met him, he rode a bike from worksite to worksite, and eventually he was able to buy a 96 minivan to get around. He had a Bible, and he owned one suit that he wore for Sunday church, where he was a deacon at a small Assemblies of God church. It was the church where we were building the playground. Terry had very little his life wasn't blessed in terms of what the Instagram post would tell you. But when Terry would stand in front of his church on Sunday and lead them in prayer, you could hear his thankfulness. God, thank you for waking me up from my sleep. Thank you for my first breath today. Now, when was the last time we stopped and allowed our breath to be a point of thankfulness? More importantly, Terry lived thankfully. It wasn't about taking stock of just the good in his life, but as living as someone who is rooted in the life of God. I believe this is what we hear in St. Paul's words today for the Philippians. When Paul thanks those who have supported him, he reminds us and reminds them that he knows what it's like to be full and what it's like to be hungry, to be with and to be without. Paul has been in jail and he's also been a leader of the Pharisees, living well. He knows what it's like for things to go well and for everything to go poorly. And yet his first thanks is to those he's connected with within the church for their graciousness, for their kindness, for the body of Christ that supports him. But he also is thankful and reflects on the power of Jesus, the verse that we often quote out of context, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's a moment of thankfulness for Paul. 
We don't often think of Paul's discussion of wor- of Jesus' discussion of worry during the Sermon on the Mount when discussing thankfulness. We think of other things about being worried, about stress, which is important to address that. But I wonder if we can read this teaching again, thinking about where our thankfulness comes from. While it's clear that Jesus is refuting worry, he's also refuting a life defined by our possessions. In verse 29, Jesus talks about Solomon, and we so often have read this verse and thought Jesus is lifting up Solomon. Look how well off he was. But I think we forget that the whole history of Solomon isn't always so great. While Solomon was a great and wise and wealthy king, he was also a king who was trapped by his idols. He was also a king who cared a little too much about what he had. And he was often, he's often considered the first king after David to really start turning away from God, to be consumed by his wives and his possessions. Maybe Jesus' reference to Solomon isn't necessarily one of great respect, but of critique. Yet I tell you, even Solomon, in all his glory, was not clothed like the lilies of the field. The flowers that get trampled by feet that get scorched by the sun are still more beautiful than Solomon, the king, the wise king. And Jesus redirects our attention to focus on the kingdom of God. Focus at what it means to have our identity rooted in who God is and what God is doing. For the breath we take for granted, for what that breath was given to us for, to join in God's kingdom work. I think a lot about what we got to celebrate today, the baptism of Adeline. Hopefully we all got to remember our baptisms for a moment. That it's not very much like, unlike Paul, who recognized that he was a part of a greater body and that that body was empowered and lived life within the reality of who God called them to be. That no matter what may come, no matter what we may experience, good or bad, We are not thankful for what we have, but for who we are, for who we are called to be, and for what we are called into, the body of Christ. Baptism reminds us of the joy of grace, that grace is available freely to Adeline, to Brendan and Landon, to the whole Kimmel family, to you, to me, to everyone in this room and everyone not in this room that the defining joy that we can thank, be thankful for that pervades our lives is this. We are children of a loving God. And whether we have much or have little, we are blessed and we are thankful that God calls us child and joins us, and joins us together as children and wakes us up to live the reality of that central truth. That when everything else fades away, We are children of God together. Gratitude and thankfulness can be found in when we thank God for what we have, but it sits still when we root ourselves in the identity God has created us to be. Blessedness is a recognition of, after that identity, the grace that spills out into the world. This isn't meant to be something to chastise us, but it is meant to be a moment to encourage us that wherever wherever life may lead us, there are things that do not get pushed away. There are things to hold on to that we can be thankful for, that we can live each day as the beloved children of God, connected to all of God's children, that that is our core of thankfulness, of gratitude, of blessedness. So would you pray with me? So God, as we come up on this season of thankfulness, allow us to take stock of the big and little things that we can enjoy. But let let your love and your kingdom be central to all of that, be priority over all of that. God, as we celebrate that we are your Christian family, that we are your children. I hope that that truth resonates deeply and that even the breath we breathe right now is a moment of thankfulness and response and grace and love. So help us live thankful lives, God, that mirror the words of Jesus.
to seek first the kingdom of God and all other other things will be given. It's in his name we pray. Amen.